Is it your assertion that there is something physically different between, say, a dolphin and a human being, or a hominid and a human being, um, say, some gene in our genome that if we could knock it out, a human would lose his soul? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And um, with respect to our model, from a biblical perspective, we would view human beings as both physical entities as, where, as well as spiritual entities. And the spiritual aspect of our nature, I think, in some respects, is perhaps beyond direct scientific observation. But what we can do is indirectly, I think, test for the existence of uh, what we would call the image of God, or what Scripture calls the image of God. The Bible teaches that it's only huma humanity that, that bears the image of God. Now, <clears throat> the Bible doesn't define what the image of God is. It just simply makes that statement. And over the centuries, theologians have debated and discussed what the image of God is. And so what we do in the book, Who is Adam, is we actually address that, the, I think, the, 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 the brunt of your question. And we say, well, if you look at the consensus as to what the image of God is, it consists of, in effect, four components. There's a, an intellectual component, so man's creativity, his technical inventiveness, his capacity for rational thought. Uh, this would even include... Uh, musical and artistic expression. There's a, a moral component. Man has a, a sense for, and a, a desire for justice, a, a seemingly inherent understanding of right and wrong. Uh, there is uh, a spiritual, uh, sorry, a, um, a relational component where man has this ability to relate to other people and as well as to relate to God. And uh, I'm drawing a blank here on the fourth one. But anyway, the idea here is that there have been four components that have been identified. Now, some of those components, I think, are beyond probing scientifically. I think other components actually can be probed scientifically, particularly the intellectual component and the, the relational component with respect to how humans relate to each other and re relate to, to God. That would be a religious expression. And so the archaeological record provides a documentation of technical inventiveness, musical expression, artistic expression, religious expression, social structure, and so you could argue that if human beings are made in the image of God, that there are certain behaviors that would manifest from the image of God that would, leave, that would be um, left behind as artifacts in the archaeological record. So the archaeological record becomes a way to probe, if you will, for when uh, the image of God would appear, who would, in principle, possess that, that characteristic. So it's an indirect way to, to probe for for something that perhaps is not physically detectable. But, you know, um, as a chemist, you know, I, I'm not sure that you can actually directly observe an electron. I, at least I know of no way currently to directly observe it. But what you can do is you can have extreme confidence that it exists because of the effects that it leaves behind. What you're really you're doing is indirectly probing for the existence of an electron, and we can understand its behavior quite quite well indirectly by the macroscopic effects that this subatomic particle essentially leaves behind. So it's a similar type of principle. Uh, now, in terms of is there a gene, uh, if you will, that if you disabled it, you would lose the spiritual capacity? And I, I would argue the answer to that is no. And, and the way I kind of think of that is a kind of a hardware-software type of analogy, that if you think of our physical makeup and our brain as being hardware, and the spiritual aspect is being the so or of our nature is being software, you can actually damage hardware and the software, though maybe it may be pristine, may not be able to be expressed properly or function properly within a computer system. So likewise, I think you can damage the brain or there can be genetic defects in the brain that would prevent the proper manifestation of man's spiritual makeup. But I don't think that, that spiritual makeup is necessarily lost or is absent. So, you know, yes, in, in some sense, there's things that you can probe scientifically, and other things I think you can't probe scientifically. And what we're trying to do with our creation model is to try to come up with ways to scientifically assess aspects of the, of the biblical creation accounts um, and try to develop predictions. And, you know, if, if at the end of the day our predictions are not detailed enough or not extensive enough, what that suggests to me is that we just have more work to do. I mean, our view is that we bear the burden of producing a model that would be recognized by the scientific community as being a legitimate scientific model. And if tonight 
we haven't convinced our two colleagues here, our two panelists, then, then it means that we have more work to do. But I, I think hopefully we've demonstrated that at least we can take substantial, or we've taken substantial steps towards that end, if not uh, being at the, the, the final point in the process.